Hi, Nadia. Um, I'm so glad that we're getting a chance to speak today, um, especially about a topic as important as lunar surface waste. Why don't you just go ahead and introduce yourself, tell everyone a little bit um, about what you do. Thank you, Britt, and it's so nice to be here to talk to you about this topic. Um, so my name is Nadia. I'm a first year graduate student on the technology and policy program at MIT. And I work um, as a researcher in the media lab where I lead the Lunar Open Architecture Initiative, where we're tracking the missions that are basically going to the moon in the future and have been to the moon and the sites that they've uh, visited and all of the scientific objectives related to those missions. And I also work in the engineering systems lab with Professor Ollie de Work on the Astro Initiative, where I provide analysis on the future of heliophysics missions and that landscape at the moment. And I'm very much interested in seeing how we can address the issue of waste management um, on the moon and what we should be thinking about now in order to prepare for the, the future that you know, many of these space companies and governments have planned uh, to put people on the moon and settle there and live there for a while. Absolutely. And so I guess maybe just to open the conversation up here, what challenges does lunar debris pose to moon exploration? So there are several challenges. Um, so when we, when we talk about lunar debris, we also need to be clear about what type of debris and where that debris is. So at the moment, there is 400,000 pounds of man-made uh, trash that's on the moon's surface. But in addition to that, there is also waste that's orbiting the moon. And I'm saying waste as a big term, but a lot of these, what I'm defining as waste, are parts of missions or missions that kind of didn't make it to the surface and were somehow pushed towards like deep space and then into the lunar orbit. So the big danger with that is if one of those pieces um, of debris were to crash onto the lunar surface, it would create a vast amount of dust plumes, first of all. So if there were people already stationed there, that would be extremely difficult to manage because that dust plume would then kind of create some kind of atmosphere around the moon, which would be very, very difficult to survive in and also understand how to see that landscape better and navigate that landscape with that uncertainty with people on the ground. And secondly, um, if if you were, so yeah, that's, that's the first obvious one. And if it crashed into a base, again, that would destroy the base and that would be incredibly difficult to navigate that challenge so we've not done that before um, so that's that's the kind of waste that we're talking about on the sort of lunar orbit the waste that's actually on the moon a lot of it is um, you know man-made waste either in the form of missions that have become defunct some uh, radio thermal isotopes which are actually you know um, made of plutonium um, so that's hazardous in the long term. However, we also need to understand that um, it becomes less hazardous over time, but it's still on the lunar surface and it's still nuclear waste and it's still something that we need to be aware of as a threat and a danger. Um, another thing we have quite in common there are basically um, poo, which is really strange, but from the Apollo missions. And we don't know what that uh, looks like now in terms of how is it decomposed? Is it reusable? Um, can we put it into a closed loop system and generate um, useful outputs from it? Um, and we don't know whether it's dangerous at the moment either because we've not investigated that. So there, it could be a biochemical hazard, it might not be. And then there's also other materials that are part of missions which we don't know how they've broken down on the surface so we can't say what the exact hazard is on the surface but definitely the lunar debris um, that's orbiting the, the the moon is something we should be aware of and should take more seriously and it's a shame that there isn't much being done in that area at the moment so that's my very long-winded response and i'm happy to clarify if you need me to. Yeah. Well, I think what's amazing about that is 400,000 pounds of man-made trash on the lunar surface. I mean, I think that's just a statistic that's going to really like 
shock people, to be honest. I mean, that's, uh, yeah. that's quite a lot. And as you, you know, as you said, I mean, it, it's kind of, um, you know, there, there's many different things. There's like, you know, kind of leftover technology, there's mm-hmm. human feces, there's things like that. So it's just really interesting to think about why is this issue a much bigger problem than even just the waste management issues that we have here on earth? Cause obviously on earth, Right. We don't do such a good job of managing our waste as it stands. But on the lunar surface, why is this even more of an issue? Yeah, I think it's it becomes really complicated because, you know, we on Earth, we usually have like very clearly defined jurisdictions, borders, who is responsible for the waste, where and, you know, how are they dealing with it? And that's usually done like at a micro level from a local level all the way up to government and then national and then you know regional levels and everybody has a set of responsibilities that they're aware of now what we don't have for uh, for the moon is some kind of agreement which explicitly states who is managing who is dealing with what type of waste that they have created from their missions we don't have that in place i mean there is one paper that i found which was from 1997 by karen kramer where she talks about the idea of a lunar users union And the Lunar Users Union would essentially mean all of those um, either states, well, that's what she was referring to at the time, or users, um, however you would um, encompass that, whether it's company or a a nation state, um, would take a portion of responsibility within the union uh, mechanism. At the moment, what we have is the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which does, you know, specifically say uh, we cannot harm, you know, any any part of a celestial body, and we can't. One like state cannot own a celestial body, um, and it's linked to that. You know, you have the um, the Committee of Space Research and Planetary Protection Policy. You've got COSPA, which is um, kind of responsible for understanding how to protect the space environment and providing those recommendations on that. Um, but again, they're 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 not really creating anything that's legally binding it's just kind of giving advice on what to do to update the ost which we know has not been updated um, in the recent uh, past so another issue we have as well is the moon treaty Um, a lot of the countries that are responsible for the waste on the moon such as like the us for example from the apollo missions um, they've not signed the moon treaty and I don't think they're going to sign the Moon Treaty, um, which would kind of give a little bit more of a legally binding um, power for them to take care of waste that they may have left behind. And another thing is the Artemis Accords, which were released, I believe, in um, 2020, do talk about kind of registering the space objects, um, such as I'm I'm imagining they will also include you know, the waste, um, and also protecting heritage. Um, so those are the heritage sites, the Apollo sites. But beyond that, um, there is, really isn't anything in place right now to incentivize or compel states to um, maybe not damage the environment. And what does that mean? Um, what, what kind of damage, what kind of materials are we using? Um, and I just want to finally add that as well with the Artemis Accords, not everybody's going to be on board with that. And I, I believe China isn't um, party to it and neither is Russia. So there are huge challenges there in terms of the legal gaps and how do we mandate that? And a further thing I want to add is, should you know people on Earth be creating that legislation for those who will settle on the moon? Or should it be created by the settlers on the moon who will create their own legal framework um, for how they see they should manage the, the, the waste on the lunar environment, which is also an interesting question um, that we need to consider when thinking about the challenges behind why it's such a difficult um, thing to tackle. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it just, I mean, to put it in really simple terms, it really begs the question of who takes out the trash on the moon, right? Um, And and trying to figure that out. 
which is super interesting. Why do you think more people aren't um, researching this actively? I feel like there's a lot of research being done on orbital debris, um, and obviously that's a really important area of, of you know study as well. But why do you think more people aren't focused on surface waste for the moon? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think firstly, you know, it's kind of like epistemology. We've, we've not really been back to the moon or sent people there in a, such a long time. So it's very far away from like our thinking right now in terms of um, connection to that environment and actually seeing it as like a viable possibility for having settlers there. I think that's the first thing. It's very far away from people's minds. Um, I think the second thing is that, you know, people who rightly so are very, very concerned about the um, orbital debris around uh, Earth um, have really, you know, taken up that space in terms of conversations there. So it really doesn't leave much room in terms of um, paying attention to deep space. And another thing I also learned is recently, there isn't really any state that has kind of a jurisdiction or um, kind of um, interest focus on a certain type of orbit in deep space, which you would think they would, like, Space Force, for example, but it's not in their in their concern. Again, because of the issue that we have in low Earth orbit with um, the overcrowding and the space debris, I think that's one of the, those are two of the big reasons. Um, and also, I think there's a lack of understanding about the lunar environment um, and just care about waste. So it's, I see it as if we've not cared right now about the waste around the earth um orbits the lower earth orbits uh, geo for example then it doesn't really put us in a good place to actually start thinking ahead we're, we're still we're still taking that very much um reactive rather than proactive approach um and it's about time um you know we did something about it because it's only become part of the public psyche in the re recent weeks where we've where we know, you know, a chunk of rocket debris crashed into the surface of the moon. They incorrectly identified the rocket in the first place. So it just tells you that there isn't actually reliable data sometimes about what we know in deep, what we know exists in deep space. So it's, it's going to take incidents like this for people to wake up and realize, ah, we should be focusing on this as a serious issue especially because of the Artemis missions that they've planned. Absolutely. Wow. I mean, such a fascinating um, topic and very important, obviously. Um, it's, it's great that, uh, that you're working on this. And honestly, it seems like we, we need a lot more people focused on it as well because it is going to be a massive issue going forward. Um, so last question here for you is, what does this project, you know, mean to you personally, um, you know, in terms of, uh, and by project of course, or maybe I should restate that. What does your work around lunar debris on the, on the surface mean to you personally? Why is this so important? Wow. Uh, that is such a deep question. <laughs> um, why is it so important? I think for me, you know, this is this this lunar environment as as all celestial bodies are including our home earth you know it's it's it is a sacred environment um there's only one moon that we're aware of that exists for us on earth and it's really important and there's only one earth that we have right so it's important to think now um about how we can preserve those environments for future generations and so that you know, we don't make the same mistakes that we have done here, especially with the issues that we're facing right now because of climate change. Um, I think that's why it really does hit home. And it makes me think, if we think of a new way of managing waste, thinking about waste, you know, what, what is it? What does it mean? Is it actually waste? Does it have to end there? Um, can that product live on in a different way and be more useful and beneficial to us? you know, using that circular economy mindset, maybe we can actually make some genuine improvements here in the way we think about waste and the way we respond to that and manage that problem. So I don't just see it as over there for the moon. I think the moon is like a, a kind of like a blank canvas 
for me to think about this problem outside of all of the biases we have here and the ways we've kind of done waste management here and propose like a new way forward to show like in this extreme environment, this is all of the things you can do with something that you would first consider as waste. And these are the reasons why you need to keep that environment free from harmful waste, which could completely um, damage future settlement. So if we can think of a new way of responding to waste, understanding waste on the moon, then perhaps we could take some of those practices, bring them to earth and adopt that circular economy method, which we really should be moving towards to deal with our own issues of um, climate change. So that's what it means to me. It's, it's promoting a new way of thinking um, about a problem that is already a big problem here, um, but waking people up by trying to make them excited about it you know and i think that people do get excited about the moon so yeah um that's why it means it means a lot to me absolutely wow what a great way to uh to end that out 